We're going to finish up the chapter on the axial muscles. Listen up, please. We have worked. Let's go back real quick. So we went to the trapezius. You got that? Yeah. That's a nice muscle, right? We can handle that. Then we did the SCM, the sternocleidomastoid. Also a cool muscle. It's actually the muscle that causes wry neck, which is when you can't move the neck. Because if this is locked, you can't move it. So we did that. And then after that, we went to the scalenes. And remember, the scalenes are the ones on the side here, right here, right in this area, right in this area of scalenes. The interesting, about the, scale, the interesting thing about the scalenes is the nerves from the neck come through the scalenes and go into the arm. Right here, brachial plexus go through the scalenes. If they are really super tight, which often happens when we do excessive stuff with the arms, because the arms are attached to the shoulder blade, and the shoulder blade is anchored to the rib cage. And the SCM muscles come from the side of the spine and go into the ribs. If you do a lot of work with this, the shoulder is pulled out by the arm and then it has scapula hangs sort of on the rib cage, the rib cage will slowly give a little bit. And you can poke it in. If that hurts, you know it's giving a little bit. Then these get very tight, and at that point the nerves get squeezed, and at that point the tunnels in the carpal hurt. So that's one place where we have carpal tunnel syndrome come from. Sorry. All right, does that make sense? I always think that's a fascinating one because that's one you have to think because not everybody's looking about, like looking at it. And then briefly we talked about the deepest muscles in the front of the spine that get injured when we have a whiplash. We, oh, we don't need to know their name for our class. I mean, you can learn it, but that's okay. Is that underneath your esophagus? No, yes. That's on the bone. That's like if I go deep here, deep in here, I get the top layer. And then I'm going to push the esophagus to the side to get these layers. It's really tough. And down in, I don't know, down in here. I have not worked this down in here. It's really tough. But when you have a head, not on the headrest, and you get smacked from the back, it goes this way. That stretch is in the front there. Or that's the reflex. That's part of it. We briefly talked about not that briefly, the suboccipital triangle is like one of my love affairs up there. I love that thing. I know, right? Well, you know, you gotta be goofy as an anatomy guy. Otherwise, not gonna try. Yeah, really. I know. So you need to keep it interesting. Um, we did not talk much about the layer in between the trapezius and the deepest layer, the deepest muscles of the suboccipital. Those are the muscles here. It's the semispinalis and the splenius. That's FYI for you guys. But what's interesting, what I always do, listen up, this is a piece that I want you to know. See this picture here? And this picture here? There is pain patterns that are these dotted areas. And there is excess in the back or in different parts of the muscle. That's a trigger point. A tension point. So if you really tighten this muscle right here, it can give you a headache there. I do this for every muscle because that way you have a guide in case you have a pain, you can go like, hmm, maybe I can do something about it. And then you go and say, hey spouse, can you help me? And can you massage this? And there's some points, can you dig into those? Or squeeze those? And then that pain goes away. Not always, but it diminishes very often. So that's, that's what I do with every muscle. Not that I wanted to have to work on other people and massage other people, but you might as well know about it. Because it's, it's really cool. When you get a lie detector injections at the doctor, so often they go into the trigger points to do it. These trigger points were not established, but sort of brought into a culminating big 
couple of volume books by John F. Kennedy's physician. You know that old guy, John F. Kennedy, you right? Yeah. So she was the only female surgeon general in America as a woman. So I got to honor her, so I put all these things up. And I do it in my office all So with that, we're going to go to the next muscle group. And those are the erector spinae muscle. The word erect means upright. Spine is the back, the spine. And muscle means muscle. So when we look at these muscles, there are actually three different types. They have one I call the iliocostalis, one I call the longissimus, one I call the spinalis. You do not need to know all of them. But it's really easy to remember them. Because you've got muscles that are laying right on top of the spine. You've got some that go a little out, or very long, and then you've got some that go to the rib. Ilio means ilium. That's where they start. So iliogostalis means it starts at the ilium, it goes to the costals. Costal is ribs. I know, right? That's kind of cool. So just so the names don't scare you so much, in anatomy, in anatomy when I, I have to learn, when I get confused and I get sort of scared, I'm like, I don't know this. I got to slow it down and look at all the words, and then it's much easier. Because you can read through it so fast, you have no clue what you're talking about. Longissimus just means it's the longest one. And then spinalis is the most that's right on top of the spine. So those are the three muscles that make up the erector spinae. And most of the time, you use this as a group. Because I did some dissections of these muscles right in here. And there's a lot of little, small little muscly and muscly and muscly. You can't even differentiate which one is exactly which. But what's interesting about these, these are the superficial muscles. So the erector spinae are the one right on top of the back. So they help you move. You know, look at this guy. Here. They help you, although I'm not totally sure this is only erector. They help you bring the spine back, turn it to the side, and also a rotation, and also when you go forward, they pull to help you not collapse forward. So they let go. There's an eccentric contraction they do, a letting go contraction. So those are some of the actions. But when we go deeper, we get to the one I like the best. That's the multifidus muscle, or multifidus. Fidus means belly, I think. But multi fibers means many, many bellies of muscle belly. When you say belly, there is called muscle belly. So that muscle, look at that muscle. Here in the green, you can see it's all the way up the spine. It's thickest in the bottom. And what it does, it goes from a transverse process of a vertebra, and it goes up a few, and goes to a spinous process above. It starts. Well, between the SP and the TP, yeah, down here particularly. And then it goes two or four levels above. And what it does, when you think about that, and you have all these muscles right here, from here to here, from here to here, they control all these little movements down in here, fine-tuning movements. There is also some that go from one to the one right above. They're like this small. They call them rotatories because they help in turning the little vertebra around. And so they, those muscles are very, very localized in movement from segment to segment, and they stabilize spinal joints severely. So that's really a big deal that they do. So this muscle, when you take a cross section, is right here. It's a big, a big soccer down there. It's a thick muscle. In the sacrum, it's the, it's the protector. It's the only big muscle we have there like that. I had a football player from the Raiders, and he was off season. He had a surgery on the shoulder. And then I just learned that new technique, and then they wanted me to work with it. And, and so I did. It was good. It helped me to develop. It helped him, too. But what was interesting, he started training during that period for the season. And down in here, it was flat, flat, and all of a sudden, it was like a, an inch pillow of muscle down here. So it was very interesting to see that. That's multifidus. 
back stabilization. They do tons of exercise to protect that low back. That guy's a wide receiver. They're going to jump and do all kind of weird things in the air. Well, it's not just in the low back, but the low back is sort of the key place because the other thing that we talk about the multifidus heavily is the fact <coughs> that it is a muscle that we have studied very strongly in, in, in orthopedics. It's right back here. This is a doctor's thing. This is a this is a cross section right through this and looking down onto it. This is the back. This is the front. You see, this is the multifidus. It's got nice darkness to it. This is a healthy subject. Down here, we have an unhealthy subject. Look how much white you see. The white is fat, not fat, but non-functioning tissue from a contractile perspective. Remember what muscle does? Muscle contracts. It's got all these little things in here that squeeze together. That's contraction. Right, if there is fat in there, it's not going to contract. It's not going to stabilize that low back. And what the studies show is if you have back pain in the past or now, neurologically, this muscle shuts off. It's the one click with aim it as it comes to the orthopedics. They studied that muscle. And we can turn it back on with different methods. One of them is doing this. The Superman. Going over the gym ball and extending and you contracting these muscles. And you can see them down in here. So this becomes one of the most important muscles when it comes to low back rehabilitation. So I put the this in here so you can see that, and I put the exercise in here so you can tell people. Just whenever you tell people about doing something, just make sure to tell them when it hurts to slow it down. Don't push through the pain, because sometimes they don't know between good pain and bad pain. You know, good pain is you go have a back pain, you take a walk, and after a walk, it's better. That's okay to have that pain because it goes away. Bad pain is you take that walk, and it gets worse. Then you slow down the walk, and you don't walk, we figure out what's up. And in back, most likely, you take a break, and then you're good. Good. That's cool. I like that. We're going to have one more core muscle that we're going to talk about that's pretty interesting. But then we get to the breathing muscle. <coughs> and um, a lot of what we talk about when we get to the breathing muscles are these out here between the ribs. So they call those rib muscles intercostal muscles. Inter means in between, costal means rib. So you got muscles right here. In between ribs. These are the external intercostals. So we're right here. External intercostals. So they're attached up on here. And they reach down to here and they pull that rib up. Then they contract. So when they pull that rib up, when it contracts, they elevate the rib. That increases your lung volume. That's called inspiration. You bring a breath in. Those are the some of the main muscles that do that. The other main muscle that does that inspiration is the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is sort of a dome-shaped muscle of the model we can see. It's a dome-shaped muscle right underneath the lungs between the chest cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity. So it's that dome-shaped muscle there. And um, it's, a, it's basically attached here in the central tendon, and then it goes around and attaches at the bottom of the ribs and the vertebrae. So it's this weird thing. It's like a parachute. And when it contracts, see, it like, looks like a parachute. And when it contracts, it pulls the whole lung down. So it goes like this, it pulls the lungs down. So it's attached to the inner wall? Sort of? Yeah. Okay. And so when it contracts, it pulls those lungs down, it goes like that, it flattens up, and it makes this volume bigger. And the lungs stand for inflate. So when you breathe, there's actually muscle you're using to breathe. The lungs passively inflate. Yes, so the diaphragm is a muscle? 
The diaphragm is the skeletal muscle. That's one of those weird things. It's because it's like it's not conscious, but you can keep holding your breath, but you will be overpowered by the brain to breathe. And so it's like a muscle that's sort of not fully conscious that way, but it's a skeletal muscle. Um, the other important thing about this parachute, well, oh yeah, if you, you know, if you, if you have, we all need to check that. Most of us breathe up here a little bit because we want to keep the stomach in. <laughs> not showing your gut. But the diaphragm ain't doing much up here. So you're using inner muscles to breathe that. You want to have the butt come out. You got much more volume you can get in that way. And so when you, if you have a problem, you do a biofeedback thing. You take a book, not my little thing, a bigger book, put it on the belly, and you see it go up and down. Because you have to push it up. And down. that's how you train yourself. So that's kind of neat. So you got these two main muscles that do breathing. We have other muscles too. They call them accessory muscles for breathing when we inhale. So, for example, on top, this, the sternocleidomastoid can pull the top ribs off. Wait, that's a scaling. Here's the sternocleidomastoid. That can pull this, this, the, the clavicle off, raise everything off. The scalings can pull off the top ribs. The serratus and here, we haven't even gone to that. Have you gone to that? No, that's one of my favorite muscles, right here. Oh. Attach it to the shoulder blade, it goes right here. If that contracts, it pulls them out more. <sighs> so, forced inspiration can happen with those muscles. And also the abdomen. <coughs> oh no, the abdomen goes with expiration. So when we expire, you exhale, take, let the breath go. The internal intercostals are attached here and pull on top and bring it down. So depressing the ribs. Internal intercostals. Pass, normal exhalation is just passive letting go. You're using the internal intercostal, you're already pushing it out a little bit extra. So there's already forced, sort of forced expiration a little bit. Uh, and then other things we can do to squeeze the, the, the chest even tighter, we can use the abdominal muscles, for example. We can use the obliques that bring it down here, and then push up, compress everything as much as we can. That's expiration. We don't need a diaphragm for that. The diaphragm just relaxes. Or has a hiccup. It's a diaphragmatic spat. Yeah, don't do it, it's a mistake. That brings me to the abdominal muscles. Oh, wait, on here. Hmm. On here, somebody must have morphed it. That's not, but you don't do this. We don't use pencil or anything on these models, so this doesn't happen. They're very expensive. Um, on here, on the model, you have the external intercostal on the side, so you can see them on the. You can see them on the side. They're they're on top of the ones next to it, which are the internal intercostals. So I have to get all these chest plates or walk around in the lab to show you, but I'll show you today what those the difference between them. So it's the only place where we can see those in that way. But let's bring it to the abdominal muscles. That's the stuff in the front. So we got the six pack, and we got stuff on the side. We got some on the side that go this way, on, we see them on this side, and then we got some that go the other way. We see them on this side. So on this side, these are taken away. So they take one layer away to expose the underneath layer. And you can see that on this side, you cannot see any bone. On this side, you see a little bone. But if these are the problems during the test, I will help you with this kind of stuff. I'm not going to give you away the muscle. I'll just say, watch out what you're doing. <laughs> then you will get it. So when we look at um, that, we have, to differ we have to identify a few more structures. We have the linear alba is a fibrous connective tissue that extends from the cyborg to the pubic synthesis. So that's from right here going oh, right to the pubic bone. It's a thick, thick connective tissue. It's a tendon that the muscles can attach to. They have to be able to attach into it or underneath, but they have to be able to hold up in the midline somewhere if they're pulling on it. Um, and then the other thing we have is a lumbodorsal fascia, and that's a deep membrane anchoring deep muscles on the back to the trunk. So 
Oh yeah, these are too dangerous. That's, a set, that's all this stuff back here. Back in here. So you got these anchoring tendons, but they're flat tendons. There's so many muscles coming into it. And, they, uh, and that's called the lumbodorsal fascia. Uh, that's not gonna come back on a test. You just have only be exposed to that term uh, at some point now. And so then when we look at the abdominals, we got four of them we want to talk about. We got the external oblique, we got the internal oblique, and then we got the rectus abdominis and the transverse abdominis. The external oblique go basically more or less from the ribs down in here and anchor into the anterior rectus sheath, that's that lineal album. Uh, they also sometimes, call, see, they have different names for things, so we gotta be, um, we gotta be, yeah, this is the linear alba, rectus sheet is linear alba. It's the same thing as that. Um, so that's up here, they go and anchor into the front here, from the ribs to the front, and then down here, a little bit from the vertebra, from the crest, and then they also go into the linear alba, and in the front, they also go all the way down, down, down to the pubic bone. So there's a big muscle coming all the way around, and you can only imagine how strong that soccer is. It's actually on this side, it's on this side. You can see that coming yeah, in right there. Oblique external oblique. And the internal oblique is almost going in the opposite direction. So it's, it's more attached in the front, I mean it says you call the cartilage and the 12 ribs, but it's more in the front of it, not in the back of it, and then we have more the front of the crest, and we get into, for the most part, we go backwards and anchor into that, um, into that, well it says pubic bone here, but I also want to get the, uh, 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 the, the lumbodorsal fascia in the back. So the way that they go, is they sort of go in this direction. Do they intersect? No, they overlay each other. Okay. So, so the external is more superficial? Yeah, that's okay. why it's external. Yeah, yeah. Um, 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 and so they go more this direction, from the okay. bottom up into it. So now, yeah, you have overlaying muscles. Okay. You got one that goes this way, and you got one that goes this way. So you got them in different angles. Okay. You're very strong. That's that, that stuff. All that stuff. That's what you want to see. Huh? You want to see that when you actually Oh yeah, to hold it. <laughs> um, the way we memorize, I memorize it, so I, I study it, is the external oblique, the, 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 the fibers go like you put your finger in the palm. So then you remember that. Fibers go this way. External oblique. Internal oblique, opposite side. If you have two, you only need to memorize one. So those are pretty cool. External is the hand into the pocket. <laughs> and then we get to the transverse abdominis. Now we go deep, very deep. We turn it around, we go that deep. <laughs> and deep in there, you got my muscle that goes right across. You see the fibers go right across. That's the transverse abdominis muscle. It goes right across. It's not thick. But what it does, it encircles the whole, oh. Now we have a core muscle. Because when you look at core, you think, think of a Coke can, a full Coke can. You can put on floor, you stand on it, no problem. Strong walls. Empty Coke can, collapse. The Coke is the bubbles push out against the metal. That's why it's strong. It's good we don't have bubbles inside push out against the wall, that'd be a problem. But for us, we can take the wall and push out inward and compress the liquid that we have in here. And when we do that, we create a really strong, strong, solid place in here. That's the core. And from that place, I can move my arms real nice and do things. But if this is not strong, oh, oh. you know how much I can injure myself? All the way, here, 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 everywhere. That's why they talk about core is so crucial. And that's the main core muscle that we work. There you go. Although that's tough to do that. 
You can just do back bridges. No, back bridges are for glutes. No, hold on. We'll figure it out. This is definitely really good. Planks. Planks. Well, you can also take, you can go lay on the back, bring your knees up, and push your knees, push your knees up to the wall a little bit and do a pelvic tilt. That's really tough. You're moving right here. But what's interesting, well, that's, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, Mr. Recap. So um, the transverse dominus basically wraps around. Goes from the costal cartilage, the iliac crest, the lumbar cervix from back here, and goes and comes to the front and acts, acts into, act, inserts into the linear alba, pubic symphysis, is the postural muscle core strength. So that's the uterus muscle? Yes. And from there we go to the outermost muscle, and that is the rectus abdominis, the six pack. It goes all the way up and down. It says it starts up here and it goes down into here, although it's not just the side for it, it's really all the ribs. It goes all the way out here. So it has this, and then it comes down. There's one, there's two. The belly button is sort of the place, and then you go down all the way to the pubic bone. So see, the belly button is the lower part. What's interesting about this muscle, actually, it's not one muscle. This is a muscle, this is a muscle, this is a muscle, this is a muscle. Because in between, you got these tendons that cross it. And they're like anchoring these little muscles into, into anchoring places. And you, what you essentially have is every little one contracts by itself. And together, they're very strong. It's cool, right? Yeah. That's why we got, it's not for the guys. We got it for the strength, which the guys obviously don't have. Look in Washington. Um, that's that. And so what does he do? He flexes the trunk, he compresses the abdominal content. Those are things that don't go. Very cool one, I like it. Oh, look, that's it. So with that, we're going to go and we're going to start working on the upper extremity. Let me find the upper extremity. The muscle man or muscle woman. Now for the um, upper extremities. Yes, ma'am. Yes, scream it out. The who? Oh yes. Yes, let's do that now. Uh, let me go to the physio briefly. We wanted to talk again at the about the We want to talk again about the muscle contraction, the sliding filament theory, how it works. When a nerve fires and wants the muscle to contract, it sends a signal onto the sarcolemma, which is muscle cell membrane. But one of its properties is it's very reactive to nerves. And so that neurotransmitter goes over and it, it, it excites it. And then the nerve impulse is an active potential, goes down to these T tubules and with that penetrates the entire muscle with all these things imaginates to the whole digitates to the whole muscle. And what it does, it stimulates the endoplasmic reticulum, 
No, the sarcoplasm reticulum in the muscle, which in normal cells is the endoplasmic reticulum, and it, that releases calcium. So the blue line here talks then to, it should have been a little bit better color, but the pale one, and that's that SR, and when that talk together, all the calcium flushes into the intracellular space. And there, it goes to the thin threads. When we look at these two threads, right, we got one that's thin, the blue one, known as the actin, and it goes to that, and it makes the calcium, no, the calcium removes a cover that is covering the active site, which is where a myosin, the head of it, attached to. It's like a magnet attachment. It's not, it's just like the active side of the actin is free, it goes on to it. It's covered with a line, with a string, when there's no calcium level left there, it's detaching. It's not attached. So then that's the cor contraction um, where we have an A, that's that sliding filament theory. Let's go to that now real quick, where we have um, the ATP cock up the little head and make it able to attach to the, um, uh, the actin, the active site, and then when it's, when it's, um, when it's attached, it pushes down, and at that moment it releases the ADP and the phosphate, and then that detaches it from it, and a new ATP needs to come in and do the same thing again. And so you've got this constant motion of these head going this way a little bit, and slowly they bring this actin and glide over and make the muscles get shorter. So that happens until the calcium is removed. And when the calcium is removed from the um, intracellular space, the active site is now then blocked and the myosin head cannot attach to it. The muscles relax. And that's it. What's that SR? What did you say the SR was? reticulum. SR is sarcoplasmic Reticulum. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> That's great. How, how does that sit in? Do you get that? Steps to understandings are you got nerve impulse. Do you get nerve impulse? The muscle needs to be stimulated. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. The nerve impulse needs to travel to the inside where it can talk to the SR. So all the nerve impulse will do is tell the SR to release the calcium. That's all. And then the calcium's role is to assure that the myosin and the actin can connect and convert with each other. Really, if you think about it. Because it, it makes the connection place possible by exposing the active side. That's all calcium does. And once that is established with calcium present, we got that interaction that we have the ATP work with the myosin to basically hold on, push down, hold on, push down, hold on, push down, hold on. That's the ATP work. And then calcium goes away, the active side's covered, the magnet is gone. We cannot do this anymore. And that's relaxation. So nerve impulse, what does the calcium do? And then how does the contraction happen? How does the contraction happen we have here again? On that sliding filament theory, so you're starting this again. That's the contraction. And if you want to know more about the uh, Calcium, I got it pretty elaborate on, as a page here. This is a cross section. The actin is not just an actin, it's an actin, it's got a molecule that's round, it's called the tropomyosin, and you don't need to know that word. And it's got a complex of like three things, it's called the troponin complex. And the calcium goes in here, 
and removes this down, it pulls this down, it exposes the active side. So the main part of the calcium is to expose the yeah. side of the active so the wire can connect. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Okay. That's it. Well, it, 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 it has to release when the calcium is not there. Because as soon as you cover the place where it can attach, it can attach. And then it will relax. Yeah, yeah it's, once you get it, it's pretty sensible. And then, you know, you, pull, you go to the next class, you plug in all com the complicated verbs. But then you get it. It's like a pulling yeah, motion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's exactly like that. All right, good. Thank you for bringing that up. Now, I'm ready for this. Are you ready for this? Mm. Yeah. Yes, I am. <laughs> so first we go talk about the muscles that attach the shoulder to the trunk. Simple. So we got a muscle that goes from the top of the shoulder all the way up to the neck. We got a muscle, two muscles that go from the side of the shoulder all to the neck, and those are in the back. So the first one is the levator scapula. I love that. Levator. Oh no. <laughs> levator means an elevator. Elevator. Ah. Where's my <coughs> <laughs> so the levator scapula, guess what that muscle does? There you go, lift up the shoulder blade. It's attached on the top of the shoulder blade, the angle of the scapula, and it goes up to the first four neck vertebrae to the side. So right here. It's always working. Everybody walk around like that. Every boss who's mad at the, no, every employee who has a boss, boss that's mad walks around like that. He's always tight. He's very strong. That muscle is like thick. It's a beefy muscle. It's very strong. Behind, underneath that, we got the rhomboids. And the rhomboids attach on the side of the medial border of the scapula, and they go basically into the vertebrae. And when you do it on both sides, that looks, that, actually on one side, it looks like a rhomboid. Um, uh, geograph geometric figure. So it goes from SP to the medial border of the scapula and it adducts the scapula, which means it brings it back. Bring the shoulder blade back. That's adduction of it. Again, I put the trigger points. If somebody hurt in here, you might go just massage it. Just unless you don't like it, then don't. You might be too hard. So that's the rhomboids. That's the ones in the back. And then we already talked, oh, no, we have one more. We talked about the trapezius multiple times. To review, goes from the back of the head, the EOP, all the way down. Nuchal ligament is this ligament in the back of the neck that it has a lot of places you can attach things into. And then it goes all the spine, it's down to T12, further down to T12. And from there, it goes out to the shoulder blade in the back, to the outside tip, that's your chromion, remember that? And then to the front, the, fat, the lateral third of the clavicle. So that's the muscle, so it does these motions in the neck, that we, in the head, and the neck that we also worked on already. But it also stabilizes, raises, stabilizes, raises, and retracts the scapula, and it can rotate the glenoid cavity upward. How is that? It pulls here, this way, this goes up. The glenoid cavity moves up. So when the shoulder blade twists this way, the glenoid cavity moves up. And we do that, guess what? When we raise our arm. We, these are attached, we can't see. But, you know, when this contracts, it moves it up like that. It moves it up like that. The glenoid cavity goes up. When we take the arm up at some point, you want that to go up. Otherwise, you're going to slam this up into the the, uh, uh, the tubercle, great tubercle into the uh, acromion process, and we know all that. So these are frozen shoulder stuff. Does that make sense? So the trapezius is a fine, fine 
muscle tissue. Fine piece of meat. Then we're gonna go more to the front of the shoulder, the scapula, to now anchor the shoulder blade in from that way into the chest. And we have one muscle that's called the serratus anterior. If you watch boxing, you watch boxing? Ha! Give you away. You see the guys, they got like these thick finger muscles right in here on the side. Right here on the side, you see them come into the ribs. It's right here, coming into the ribs. So from there, they reach back underneath the shoulder blade and attach right in here on the bottom of the shoulder blade, on the inside, below the rhomboids. So what they did here, they flip the shoulder blade back and you can see it attaching there. That thing glues that shoulder blade to the chest. And if it's wimpy, you know, you have the loose scapular thing. You can just fly. You got the wings. Some of us do that. Most of us are really, really tight in these areas. So when we look at what the attachment sides are, we have the ribs here, and then the anterior medial border of the scapula. That's the shoulder blade in there. Protracts the scapula and holds it to the chest, that is. Uh, and look, you can give you a lot of pain. There it is. That's a very, very important muscle. It's pretty much wimpy on most people. It's like, you know, it's like we do this. And so that has to do with the serratus. So a lot of it has to do with the wimpy. It's the wrong ones in the back. If you want to strengthen it, you know, you do plank type stuff. You make sure the shoulder blade doesn't go back. You hold the, shoulder, the chest to the shoulder blade. When I work with people that have a loosey thing here, they have to be careful with what they do here in order to not affect all this because of their neck pain. I tell them to not move your arms above, outside, not use, move your hands outside of this window. So you're not, you know, pulling too much on the thing. And range, and when you go get groceries or so, you try to hold your elbows in and attach this as a unit, and not like that. I know, and you know, you can do whatever you want. We old people need to watch out. Um, then we have pectoralis muscles. We have two pectoralis. We have pec major and pec minor. We're going to now talk first about the smaller one, the pec minor. So the pec major is the boob muscle. Because you know the rock when you can squeeze both together or the one, you know, that guy. Oh, yeah, that, that's this muscle. It's the one, that's why the mirror in the gym is in the front. And then you look in the back, you're like, really? Nothing there, just here? It's funny. So this muscle, though, is underneath that, and it's the pec minor. And it's attached, well, it starts at the ribs, and goes into that coracoid process. That's why we want to know the coracoid process. Coracoid! And it depresses, so it pulls on that thing. And so you can only see what happens. It pulls the shoulder blade down, so it depresses it, but also it um, pulls the scapula downward. So when we do this, we want that to contract a little to pull it down a little bit. So that's, that's what it does as well. Uh, and when we, do it, uh, when we do deep breathing, it helps pull the ribs up. So it really helps up there on top. So that's a cool muscle. And with that, those are the muscles I use when we get to shoulder anchoring. Um, and in your booklet, you got this. Now we should start talking about this. This. This is, this is not accurate. Is that the spreadsheet? Mm -hmm. No, it's not online anymore. It's an empty link right now. But it's only not accurate because it doesn't tell you all the little details of what's what and what's what. It gives you overview. So on here I have seen that muscles connected the shoulders of the axial skeleton and then you have all of them listed and you got all their insertion, origin and action. I'll give you one. And so that's for me as a, sorry, as a study guide a little bit. 
But it drives me crazy when I got these books, and in a book it's like every little detail is described. It's a little there, it's a little there, it's a little there, and it's like so confusing. And it does not matter right now. If I need a whole cup of muscle exactly, yeah, it matters because I need to figure out how to palpate it. And then I go for that detail, but not to memorize. I was always freaking out about that. I don't want you to freak out about that. So that's why I made this. And then with this, at least, even later, you can plug in the details you need on accuracy, but you get an overview. So the next place we need to, oh, another thing, in the back of the booklet, Haha. <laughs> is, is it accurate enough to use on the study line? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, it's not, it's, no, it's, it's accurate. It's just not necessarily as detailed oh. as other books may be doing. Oh. Because I say, oh, it's attached to the greater tubercle. It's not attached on the inferior medial side of the greater tubercle. Who cares about that? Not at that level. That's just confusing. But in this booklet, also what you have, you have a few things that you can utilize now. In the back page, you have a link that goes to flashcard muscle pictures that you can cut out. It's a PDF. You cut out and you make flashcards with it, if you want. You don't have to. And then this scans to one of my Dropbox, uh, public Dropbox things, and it has about 100 or almost 100 cadaver videos. So I have a list that you can print out that looks similar to this. Just a spreadsheet with all the muscle and the names of what I have to name it for a file. And below that, then you have the FGM. It's a 20-second clip. The levator scapula is a 15-second clip. So you really see how it is on a cadaver. You don't have to use this, utilize this. I made this myself, and I started this technique stuff. But I was afraid I wouldn't, wouldn't succeed in it. So I made it, so I might as well give it to you. So if you're interested in that, that's where you can link to that. No excuse not to study the stuff. Huh? Then next now, what we need to talk about is the, sh the anchor the shoulder blade into the chest. Now, how are we gonna anchor this arm into the shoulder blade? We're gonna hold this arm into the, into the, into the scapula. Where will we find those muscles that anchor the shoulder, the arm into the scapula? Right here, in the scapula. So we got four muscles that, are you guys paying attention or visiting the Bahamas or what? Oh, good. Excellent, excellent. That's when I hear shushus in the old days, they were, you know. The reason why I made videos is because I got so pissed off in lab and people look at bathing suits. Instead of looking at myself that I'm trying to have, and so that was that's why that was video. I had a lot of people bitching and moaning about, oh, it's so expensive to print out all these things. I say, you got an HP? They say, yeah. I say, go buy a Canon. Then I figured I make my booklet, so I don't have to hear, hear the complaining of students. We don't like you complaining. Anyway, you don't like me complaining. So the sense most well it's about responsibility and students very often they don't feel like they you know it's a, it's a give and take a lot of people in here they come from high school it's a totally different animal you know I don't you know you you in this college you have to be on your own a little bit more but anyway anyway I lose myself six muscles we got three in the back and we got one in the front they are the rotator cuffs because they rotate the cuff and when we look at all of them, we have an acronym called SIDS. Because we got a supraspinatus, we got an infraspinatus, we got a subscapularis, and we got a teres minor. Now look at those names. We learned the word spine in the scapula. We learned the word supraspinous fossa. And we learned the word infraspinous fossa. Who sits in the supraspinous fossa? The supraspinatus. <coughs> and in the infraspinous fossa, the infraspinatus. So you got two in one. So the supraspinatus is actually a really interesting one. It's the most Where is it? Is that it? Yeah. It's the one that's most torn when we have a, a, a rotator cuff tail. 
And so it's attached here in the supraspinous fossa and goes to the greater tubercle of the humerus. All the ones from the back go to the greater tubercle of the humerus. All of that. Because the greater tubercle is here, the lesser tubercle is here. The one from the back goes into the greater tubercle. The one from the front goes to the lesser tubercle. It stabilizes the shoulder joint. They all stabilize the shoulder joint. They all pull the shoulder in. They pull the humerus in and hold it and move it around the world. And so this muscle is an interesting muscle. We have to get back to it. But it doesn't just stabilize. It also moves the arm up. So it does this motion. It elevates, uh, abducts the arm, uh, the initial part of it. And then um, the other thing that all the and I don't know why it's not there, but all the externals, well, I guess not, the humor is not that much. The supraspinate is not that much. A little bit, the infra much more, they all do this. They help with this. So if you bring your arm out, because the rotation happens up here. So if you bring your arm out, you rotate your humerus laterally, that's all these muscles back here, they're pulling on it, they're bringing the arm out that way. Make sense? That's more the infraspinatus because that's in the infraspinatus box that goes right there. So when you see that pole, it's a strong rotational pole. It's attached all here. The supra goes more on top, so it's a little harder to do the pole. But it's assisting that. And then we got the teres minor. Now, whenever you see a minor, you will have a major. Minor and major. Because we do not want redundancy. And if there's only one teres muscle, you just say teres muscle. But since there's a minor, you know there's a major. And that one is basically I mean, the same as the infraspinatus. It's just attached further down, and it goes into the same place. So you can see right here. Lateral border of the scapula. <clears throat> and the last one of the, that trio, that quattro, is the subscapularis. And that's the underneath muscle out of the shoulder blade that goes from underneath, underneath here and reaches all the way out to the lesser tubercle and pulls the arm in from the front. So you've got three that yank it in from the back, one that comes in from the front, and that holds it nice and firm. So that's on the anterior side? Yes, the subscap is underneath the shoulder blade. Sub means underneath, so that's how I remember that. And that subscap also does this. It brings the arm inward because if that if that here yanks on it, it brings the arm in. Those are really cool. Supraspinatus is the one, and they talk about a frozen shoulder. Talk about supraspinatus. Like the, the outside third or so has no vascularity, is not, has no blood. And so that, that tears a lot of fast. Huh? That's the one that gets torn the most? That's the one I guess to one of most, yeah, supra. And then we move the arm around. Now let's get to the arm movers. The first one I want to talk to you about has very, is very closely related, related to the um, supraspinatus. So when we get to the arm, we got these models here. Those muscles come out. They go back in. It's the muscle pulse. The supraspinatus is right here on top. The infraspinatus is right here on the bottom. We can take this top one off so we can see the spine real nice. The teres minor is right here. Sort of the lowest on the bottom that goes into the arm. This one goes underneath. It doesn't go into the outside of the arm. So you follow where they go. You do not have to give me origin insertion on the test, but it's good if you know a little bit about it, because you figure out where the muscle goes in order to label the muscle. But now what we do is we're going to put on top another muscle. It's called the deltoid muscle. And it goes similar to the trap, in some ways, the origin here is the lateral third of the spine of the scapula, the acromion, and then it goes in the front and does the lateral third of the clavicle. So it wraps around. Actually, it does, oh, no, it does almost all of the spine of the scapula. 
And then it goes into a bump that needs work. What's this bump called? Deltoid tuberosity. Or, you know, I'm sure tubercle, as you find the tubercle somewhere, is described. Because often tuberosity, tubercle, you know, it's similar. Yeah, tuberosity is supposed to be bigger, tubercle is supposed to be smaller. Now, why is this a tubercle and that's a tuberosity? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Too much wine. Um, that deltoid muscle does this. It brings the arm up. But if you look at it, it's arranged in some weird way that it comes from here and it grabs and goes right down here. And like it goes right down. And so when you just contract that and you want to bring the arm out, it's just going to yank it up. It's not going to bring it out. So what you have to do is you have to use the supraspinatus coming from above and bring it out a little bit until the angle is good and then the rest can be done by the deltoid. Ah, which is interesting because, uh, here's an exercise, PR trigger point, but what's interesting is somebody has a torn supraspinator, frozen shoulder, you get them walking around, they can't do this, they do this, so they just don't do it, they have to do this if they want to raise the arm. But then you decide, you know, oh, your super spray is messed up. People are pressed when you say that. Why did you know that? So that's cool for that. So then with that, I can go back to the pack major now. That's the man boom muscle. It's attached all around here. Rib, sternum, clavicle, all around. It's big muscle. Even have some, no, it has a hidden one. Might be this. And then from there, it goes into the humerus, into the, what is it there? Intertubercular groove. That one that's not music. Yeah, in between the tubercles. So it goes from here and hangs in the, guess what it does? It pulls the arm in. So it, you always think of what, where the attachment is. What is he going to do with these attachments? All it does is contract. So he pulls the arm in. It adducts the arm, and it also immediately rotates when you look at where it's attached. It's attached here, it pulls on it this way. But the big one is this. You got the front, you got this muscle, and in the back, you got. Look at it. You got this muscle. Look at this guy. These guys also won the Olympics as a team. He's part of the team, but look at the difference. That's his deltoid. The deltoid is a muscle, so the front you got the pack, in the back you got, I mean the latissimus, sorry. In the back you got the latissimus, and it comes from all the way to the bottom, all the way to the spine, it goes into that arm again. And guess why they're so big? It does this. And it does this. It does this motion. It's that muscle here. So it's the, the deltoid in the back brings it, uh, adducts it. The pack in the front adducts it. But of course, swimming, you need more the back. That's why it's so much bigger on that. It also helps with arm extension. And it also helps, again, with the medial rotation. Which is all the stuff you need for, for crawl swimming. That's why I love that. So that's the pec and the lat latissimus there. And then we got a couple of smaller ones here. In the front we got one that's called the coracoid That goes from where? The coracoid process. To the brachium. Oh, anything here, brachium. Brachialis, biceps brachii, brachioradialis, triceps brachii. So many names. Coracoid process, shaft of the humerus, it does this. Arm flexion. No, arm flexion. Sorry. Arm flexion. Up the arm, not the elbow, and a little in. You see where it's at. It goes a little bit medial when it pulls. We did the deltoids. We did the lats. When we do the lats, latissimus, that's where we add on the teres major. 
So the Terry's major is a little cousin of the Latissimus Dorsi because the Latissimus Dorsi comes from all the way down here and fe oh, feeds into here. It's this big thing. And then you've got a little helper that's right attached at the bottom of the shoulder blade and goes also in there. So, and it makes sense. Because when we, whoa. When we look, this massive muscle coming from up here and going into the arm here, we might as well get one little come from here and help. Attach to this bone too and pull on this bone also. So we don't just all pull from here, we also pull a little from here. So that helps. Uh, no, just for the complete of the motion. It's a synergist, it's a helper. Um, um, and synergist with this Uh And it's called the Terry's Major. It's right here. When you look here, you see supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, goes in the same place here, and the one that goes inward is the teres major. Because it goes all the way into the arm, into the armpit. Huh? Yeah, it's pretty big. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah basically goes in the armpit. So that's the teres major, and now we finally make it <laughs> to this very egotistical muscle called the uh, biceps brachii. Yeah? Bi means two. Biceps means two heads. So this muscle has this muscle attaches down here in the um, radial tuberosity. Remember, we briefly talked about that when we talked about the extremity bones on the radius, this bump right here is the radial tuberosity. So this muscle goes all the way from up here and anchors into this part. The radius, right? Yeah, it's on the radius. It's a small bone here. So that does that. And it goes up here, it splits. And one, one of the tendons go through the inner tubercular groove. That's actually why we got that groove that deep because there's a ligament over it holding it, and the other one goes to the carcoid process. So it's coming up from here, somehow, wait, here, where are we? Here we are. From here, and it goes through this, and anchors actually into the tip of that, into the glenoid. And the other one comes and goes into here. So it gives it a little lateral control. Because it's going to pull that elbow and does this as a flexion of the elbow, but also when you think of when the hand is pronated, this bump goes underneath. And so when it then pulls, it turns the radius and it brings the palm up. That's called supination. Supination. Yeah, it's a fascinating muscle. And on the model, I will show you on the model. Here. So, on a model, it's the one in the front. When you take it out, you see the two splitting on the back, on top. So, that's the giveaway for that. Underneath that is the brachialis muscle, more brachial stuff. And the brachialis muscle goes. The brachialis muscle goes from the shaft to the humerus to the anterior proximal ulna, as far as I'm concerned. It's the coronoid process, but you know, who cares there? I mean, it's right here, but we don't have to be that specific. But it goes from here into here. And what does it do? It just simply pulls. <clears throat> Flexes the elbow. One more part that's interesting, if you think about most most muscles, or yeah, cross one joint, brachialis crosses the elbow joint. Biceps brachii crosses two joints. So I did not specify that, but you also have a little bit of helping with this stuff, with the biceps brachii. Because it goes all the way here. So it's going to pull on here too. Not much, but a little bit. So some muscles go through joints. Then that brings us to the forearm already, and that's the biceps, that's the brachialis. And there we're going to stop. So that's the brachialis, and the brachialis muscle is attached to the distal end of the humerus, 
Actually, we'll do one more after that, but then it's goes from the distal end of the humerus. So it goes all the way, right? A little bit on the humerus, so a little bit up here. And it reaches down to the uh, radial styloid process, which is this bump in here. So on the model, you can see it. It's this long muscle that comes all the way from the top, early, almost uh, halfway up in the humerus, and reaches all the way down, almost into the thumb. It's the top on the ridge. Radio radialis muscle. It does this. So it, it, it pulls from here. So it, it flexes the elbow, but it has a long, long flexion from the forearm. So we have these muscles here that go to the proximal, and this one goes to the distal forearm. So it pulls that. Wait. And on the brachium that leaves me is the triceps brachium. Break the eye. And try it means three. Three head. Ha! Huh. So this is like the biceps brachia and the brachialis combined in the front. You know, we go front, we go back. It's the agonist antagonist situation. So that one muscle of one part of that muscle goes into the um, infraglenoid tubercle in here. So this the bottom part of the joint. This, the biceps goes to the top, this goes to the bottom. And then we also have uh, going on to the shaft of the humerus and the scapula. So I didn't write that down. We got one the shaft of the humerus, one to the no infraglenoid tubercle, that's correct. And it's actually it's two is to the shaft of the humerus. And then what's interesting with this though, they all anchor into the tip of the elbow. And what's that called? Electronome process. They all fit into the electronome process. And all what they do is extend the elbow. That's their main action. A little bit of this because the muscle goes up, one goes up here, but that's a minor thing. For us, it's extension of the elbow. And with that, we're going to leave the word salad behind and have you. Do a little more of that in groups. <laughs>